Hello everyone, welcome back to the second XR2 Ravenstar tutorial for Orbiter 2010. Today we will be covering critical systems management. So we'll talk about coolant, refueling, bay tanks behavior, and center of gravity shift. Today I'm demonstrating the Angel White skin. You might be asking uh, why we're not going straight to maneuvers and flying. And the answer is because, if you remember, I said these are critical systems, which basically means if you just get out and you start flying, sooner or later, they're going to get you at a bad time. And uh, managing these systems is critical to uh, your simulated survival. So with that, we will uh, start talking about the coolant system. Okay, so like all spacecraft, we have computers on board, and all computers give off some degree of heat. Uh, in an atmosphere, you can dissipate the heat using a cooling fan, like the fan on your CPU, or if you have a gaming PC, the five or six uh, cooling fans that are uh, inside your tower. But the issue is, when you go to space, there's nothing to convect around. You could just put a fan on there and it's not gonna do anything except spin like a wheel. Uh, no air would be moved and no cooling would actually be done. In fact, a fan would probably make things worse because you would, at that point, be blocking the radiation from escaping. So, we have a way to deal with this. Uh, internal to the craft, there are a number of, which you won't be able to see, uh, heat pipes and uh, conductive paths. And these heat paths and Information. Uh, conductive APU paths fuel 90%. will lead up to a radiator. And you can open this radiator on the ground or in space, but you can't open it when you're traveling in an atmosphere. So this is the radiator here. It's basically a large panel which allows the heat of the computers to uh, radiate their waste heat into space. And that is now open. So that is one of two ways to cool your spacecraft down. Again, you can't do that when you're flying in an atmosphere. You can do it in space, you can do it on the ground. Now realistically, you would also have to keep this radiative side facing opposite the sun in order for this to work. Uh, as it stands now, this is actually exposed to the sun, which means uh, in real life, this would be heating up, not cooling down. It'd be uh, essentially a radiation heater. Uh, but because time acceleration and attitude control do not go well together in Orbiter 2010, uh, that aspect is not simulated, and I advise not trying to simulate it uh, lest you be at your desk for one year simulating a real mission. So we'll go ahead and close that for now. Now, when you're on the ground or docked, no flight, no flight in atmosphere, no flight in space. You have the option of connecting an external fuel line. This is meant to be simulated by an air conditioning truck, which actually pulls up to the craft and you can plug it into one of the service ports underneath, just like an airplane, likely in the wheel well. A service port. So to do that, you uh, control arrow down to the bottom panel. And here's the external cooling hatch right here with a status light. You'll notice right now the coolant temperature is rising and that's because we have the radiator closed. We also have the external cooling hatch closed and we have the APU on. If you have the APU Pitch. on, oh it actually causes a rapid increase in temperature. You'll notice the rate that the temperature is rising. If I shut off the APU, 
that rate should taper a little bit. We'll still be going up in temperature, but not as fast. So it's kind of hard to tell, but there is a little bit of a decrease, maybe about a 20% decrease. So using external O2. I am opening the external cooling hatch now. External cooling online. And now you can see that the temperature is slowly coming down. If I turned off the APU, that should come down a little bit faster. There you go, that's a little bit more obvious. In addition to connecting the external cooling hatch, if you're in a danger situation, like let's say your temperature is between 80 and 100 degrees Celsius, 100 by the way is your max, you can get computer system failures above 100 degrees Celsius. Um, we can open the radiator too. And once the radiator is fully open, the coolant loops will connect and you should see the temperature go down faster. And there you go. That is very much proof. Again, shutting off the APU will make that go down even faster. So if you get yourself into a situation of high temperature, you can do those three actions, APU off, cooling hatch open, radiator open, and your temperature will drop off a lot faster away from the dangerous area. Uh, you can only cool your craft to 31.2 degrees. At 31.2 degrees Celsius, the coolant loops will stop operating uh, until the temperature goes above that. So basically you'll You'll see it bottom out at 31.2, and uh, nothing will happen. Uh, as you can see, by the way, you have to have the APU on in order to um, close and open the radiator. You do not have to have the radiator, radiator on to open and close the external cooling hatch. Using onboard O2. Now, as you can see, the rate is pretty high. Um, in a little bit longer than about an hour, you will overheat uh, if you don't enable cooling, uh, which means that generally you want to get to space quicker. But I did say that the XR2 was flying better in an atmosphere, and you need to have the APU on in order to run the uh, hydraulic flight control services over here Pitch. but uh, your coolant temperature is going to go up so if you're flying what's the answer I did talk about the radiator in space there is a maximum dynamic pressure for the radiator here if you look over here which is 16 kilopascals that's the damage threshold so you really need to be careful about that but if we went up flying we would actually be able to see, uh, if you go to the surface HUD, or MFD rather, you'll, note the, you'll notice the dynamic pressure right here. And you can actually fly the craft slow enough at 40,000 feet in order to open up the radiator. But only just. Um, you'll be at about 7.5 7 degrees pitch up, uh, and you really can't fly any slower than that or you'll stall, you can't fly any faster than that, or you will uh, damage the radiator. So that's just a little bit of a trick that I've noticed is there is actually a sweet spot where you can fly the craft with the radiator open in an atmosphere. Okay, so that's just about all you need to know for coolant management. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about refueling and then we'll talk about how the bay tanks uh, interface with refueling. So as I shown on the panel overview, you have a fuel hatch here on the back uh, port side and on the back starboard side you have a box. 
So the LOX hatch is going to be blue. Um, the fuel hatch is going to be red. So if you have the ability to refuel, then you can open your fuel hatch and you will get a uh, external line pressure. So if we're flying, obviously that's not possible. The only two times to refuel are landed and when you're docked. So currently we are landed. So I'm gonna open the, let's do the LOX hatch first, because that's a little bit simpler. LOX hatch open. LOX resupply systems online. Okay, and as you can see, we have external line pressure, and this is to be expected oh. because we are on the ground. So again, take a look. There it is, blue hatch. We have the line pressure, something is next to it. Uh, so we can go ahead and click this external supply line here to initiate the refueling of liquid oxygen. And you can also stop it midway. Uh, a lot of times you don't need all your fuel to do a mission. So you'll really only fill what you need in order to accomplish the mission. And generally that's done to save money. Totally up to, um, totally up to you, but I prefer to run my missions realistically. Now in the event that the tank fills, the filling will stop automatically. And if we look, right? Lox tanks full. There you go. So it has stopped itself. Uh, we're all set to do. Again, if you do this, try to reactivate the valve, uh, it won't open, basically because the tank is full. So at this point, we can go ahead and close the LOX hatch. LOX resupply systems offline. And you don't need the APU in order to do this. And one of the reasons is so that you can actually empty the APU fuel, because if APU is out, then obviously uh, your APU shuts down, and if you can't open the hatch, that's kind of like a um, catch-22. So you don't have to worry about getting into that situation. All right, we're going to go over the fuel resupply systems now. Fuel hatch open. Refueling systems online. Okay, now notice we get three here. We get main, we get the scram, and we get the APU but there's none for the RCS. The only way to fill the RCS tank is by cross-feeding the system from the main tank. Uh, this is because the RCS and the main fuel are exactly the same. So the RCS tank is really just a small holding tank for uh, the main fuel. And it's also a good emergency um, auxiliary fuel tank, uh, similar to a diver's pony tank to allow them to continue the mission, even though you look at you look at the fuel levels and you're like, oh my God, 4% fuel left. No, it's okay. We have a little bit more than that. It's in the RCS. You'll, you saw that demonstrated during my uh, Venus flyby. I tried to demonstrate as many features of the craft at the same time. Uh, normally, I don't like to do that. The RCS is there only for uh, emergencies and um, I plan my missions out so you don't get emergencies so the configuration file which I'll talk about later that goes to the XR2 can specify where you can refuel there are there are three locations defined where you can refuel the ground of any planet the, the uh, docked to a spacecraft or on the ground Earth only. So generally I think the way that the uh, config file comes by default is you can refuel your main fuel while you're docked or while you're on the ground at any planet. You can only refill your scramjet while landed on the Earth and you can refuel your APU tanks landed on any planet or docked to any spacecraft. 
And the, the reasoning that you can only refuel the scram fuel on the Earth is because you need oxygen in the atmosphere in order to use your scramjets. Um, and Earth is the only planet in the solar system with oxygen in its atmosphere. So as soon as you leave Earth's orbit, the scram fuel becomes... Um, honestly, it just becomes extra mass that you don't need. Uh, on a real mission, you would actually want to do a scram dump with whatever scramjet fuel you have left. Uh, it's very similar to jettisoning a lower stage that's empty. Because you can't, you can't use your scramjet once you're outside of the atmosphere. Now, I've changed this config file, and you can change it too. Because I do a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, extraterrestrial and uh, exoplanet flying. And I have a number of exoplanets that I fly to and fly in between that have oxygen atmospheres. Therefore, I want to be able to refuel my scramjets on those respective planets as well. Okay, so with that, I'll show you to refill the main. It's just the same as the locks. Now, when you need to fill the RCS, what you're going to do is you're going to right-click this crossfeed switch cross -feed RCS. to RCS. And the crossfeed switch is actually so slow that you'll continue to fill your main tank. Now, if I stop cross it in between and we flip it the other way, main. now we're hyper-filling the main tank as quickly as we possibly can. Crossfeed off. Crossfeed RCS. We'll go ahead and wait for those to fill. Uh, same thing, you know. Cross stop your crossfeed. Off. Close the uh, close the fuel supply line, and you you can stop halfway. Crossfeed RCS fuel tanks full. And when you fill up, your crossfeed will automatically go back to off. Crossfeed off. And you cannot do that. Main fuel tanks full. You cannot do the crossfeed when your RCS is full. The main is full now. Crossfeed off main fuel tanks full so as you can see everything is already full so you can't move any fuel around we can also refuel the scram fuel which we'll do now again that's the exact same and we'll do the apu as well again you can stop and restart at any point APU fuel tanks full. Scram fuel tanks full. Okay, our systems are entirely full. So at this point, we can now close the fuel hatch here. Refueling systems offline. And I did mention in the uh, panel overview... Hold to dump locks. Exactly what she said. Hold to dump fuel. So that allows you to lighten your weight so that you're within the maximum landing weight, which I think is, is printed somewhere around here on the... Um, uh, maybe not. I think there's a maximum landing weight. Um, I normally have don't have to worry about it because I'm pretty close to zero fuel whenever I end a mission. So uh, when you're docked... It's exactly the same way. Locks Information. Dumped. APU fuel 80%. Warning. Locks dump. Okay, so I've docked us APU to fuel near. Warning. Locks dump. And I'm performing a dump of various systems. Warning. Locks dump. And I'm going to demonstrate a refuel. Crossfeed main. Crossfeed off. So, even though Mir didn't have uh, significant fuel reserves on board, uh, we can actually simulate such a thing. So, what we're going to do now is open Locks the liquid oxygen open. and fuel the fuel hatch open. at the same time and see what we get on the supply lines. Locks resupply system, refueling systems online. Okay, that's what I thought. So, I did change the scramjet functionality here. So, in the default config file, you probably would not get your scramjet external line pressure. And that's, again, because once you're in space, the scramjet fuel doesn't do you any good. Same thing as on the ground. This time, I'm going to do everything at once. We're going to do locks, APU, scram, and main. Crossfeed RCS. 
RCS fuel tanks full. And that's good enough. Refueling systems offline. Locks resupply systems offline. Okay, so that is how you refuel. Now, notice how on the bottom here, um, everything is green. It's the same shade as, uh, of green. Let me refuel the tanks real quick. One thing to note is when she says that the systems are online, they're not completely online. You have to wait for the external line pressure to go green before you can start refueling. Otherwise, we'll complain about it. Locks tanks full. Eight locks resupply systems offline. Scram fuel tanks full. Alright, so if I open my locks hash and as soon as she says that the systems are online, I try to add pressure, watch what happens. Main locks hatch open. Locks resupply systems on no external line pressure. See what happens? No external line pressure. You gotta wait for the green light. Now we would be able to refuel. Locks resupply systems offline. Refueling systems offline. Okay, so again, um, just to see, all the tanks here are the same color of green. Same thing up here. Everything is green and your tank levels are right here. So take a look at those tank levels and then we're gonna talk about the bay tanks. Also, notice how quickly the coolant temperature's been coming up. We're already up to 57 Celsius. We'll have to do something soon or we'll overheat. When starting any scenario, it's a good practice to get in the habit of turning on your external cooling line. Using external O2. External cooling online. But don't forget to close it. So we're going to take a look at the uh, bay doors now. And I'm not going to do a full tutorial on how to add and remove cargo. But what I will do is demonstrate how this would be loaded in a uh, payload processing facility. Okay, so imagine that you're in the Shuttle Orbiter Processing Facility. You don't know what that is, you can basically Google it. Basically, it's a bunch of scaffolding all around the Space Shuttle, which allows you to load and unload cargo and is protected and clean. Okay, so to simulate that, we have the Payload Editor here. If you click the Payload Editor, you will now see that it's up. So, the next thing we're going to do is go to Selected Payload Object here and click the drop down. So there are two, actually three tanks that are applicable to what we're talking about now. So you have, this is an empty LOX tank. So it's basically a, it's the housing. There's nothing inside it. Now this is a main fuel tank. Uh, Information. APU running. I'm not exactly sure what the advantage of giving an empty liquid oxygen tank is, other than maybe sharing it between vessels. Um, taking one with you and then you'll refuel it once you get to the mothership or something. Uh, I guess that's one way of doing it. And then you also have, uh, this will refuel your main fuel tank and your RCS. And this is your scramjet uh, fuel tank. So you can take as many of uh, whatever as you would like. Note that there is no there is no uh, external bay tank for your APU. So there is no way to increase your APU 
uh, runtime other than with the cheat codes, which we'll get into in a much later episode. So again, select the platform you want. APU running. Let's say we're going to go on a really, 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 really long flight in the atmosphere. Well, if I add Bay Tank 2 and then select 3, I now have a ton of scramjet fuel. If I click it here, it'll give me information on it. Its mass is 3,705 kilograms, etc. Now, to figure out how much uh, usable fuel this adds, close the payload editor and then return to the upper panel. And now you're going to control arrow down. And now you can see your scramjet reserve has increased to 10,050 kilograms. And notice this peacock green color on the right contrasting to the lime color on the left. Again, control arrow down. You now see that there is a slightly different coloration. And everything that's that peacock green color is given to us via the external tanks. APU running. So now we have tons more fuel thanks to the extra tanks that we've added. Now to get rid of these, just hit remove all. And there you go. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add a liquid oxygen. And we're going to add a main fuel. This is usually the loadout that I like to use. Um, again, the scramjets, at least for um, flights within the solar system taking place in the 21st century. Um, flights further and beyond, I like to use extra scramjet because like I said, exoplanets. APU running. But generally, in the case of the solar system, your scramjet fuel will just about run out on its way to space, which is what you want then you take an extra liquid oxygen tank so that you can live longer and an extra fuel tank if you're going to a very large planet uh, such as Jupiter. Okay, so close the payload editor, return to the upper panel view, control down arrow, and now you can see that there is extra main fuel. It's not as much, it's about 80%, but we went from about 13,960 or something kilograms to 16,746 kilograms. And, um, down here, we have the exact same thing. Now, the behavior of the tanks is to burn what you have in the tanks first, and then the internal second. So if I do a fuel dump, it should let us know when that Warning. system is empty. Fuel dump. Information. APU running. Warning. Fuel dump. Warning. Fuel dump. So we should get a status message Warning. that the external bay tank is empty. Warning, fuel dump. Warning, fuel dump. Warning, okay. fuel dump. There it is, right there. Alert, bay tank's empty, number two. So if you're in flight and you see this, after whatever burn you're doing, and you stop the craft, you have a choice to make. If you are in a situation where you are leaving a mothership, you can return to a mothership, or you've left a base and you can return to the base and you're nearby. Basically, if there's an opportunity to refuel your, your tank um, before a long part of your mission, then uh, hold on to your tank. Now, in the event that you're in an Apollo-like situation where you're out at, say, Mars, and the closest fuel is back at Earth, and you're going to run through 70% of your remaining fuel, that's 80%, you want to get rid of that tank. So we're going to go to the payload camera view, you open up your bay doors, you select the payload that you want to jettison, which in this case is two, and hit deploy. Now on the ground, this is going to place it um, on the runway next to the craft. But in space, this would jettison it at a set speed. 
right now this is this is showing the readout but uh, when you're in space you will have a uh, toggle button here for setting a, a speed of deployment and that's usually set to about 0.5 meters per second or something so it would just lift magically well not magically it would be sprung up directly up and it would you know essentially rise up like a balloon and then be gone so just click deploy payload deployed and now it's gone so we've lost about um, let's see if we go back to the payload editor and select the empty locks one um, yeah we've now lost about 355 kilograms or just over a thousand pounds about 1,050 pounds. So you're going to uh, benefit from that in the long run. You'll end up using less fuel. So that's just a uh, thing you want to do. Otherwise, you know, if we took the mothership to Jupiter, we're visiting Io, and we're going to go right back. Don't deploy it because you want to refill that tank when you get back to the mothership so that you can then go to Europa. Um, things like that. Okay, so I think that's everything that I need to explain about the bay tanks. Uh, the next thing that we're going to talk about is the center of gravity ships. Pitch on. So in, in highly advanced space, uh, not spacecraft, in highly advanced civilian aircraft such as the Concorde, uh, one of the things that you need to do, because it's a delta wing, is shift your center of gravity. And the advantage of shifting the center of gravity is to adjust what angle of attack is uh, suitable for you. Base lot is occupied. Whoops. Payload latched in bay. Okay. So, generally, in the case of the Concorde. Oh. you would uh, be able to adjust it forward or backwards over the course of several minutes using fuel. Now, in the case of the craft here, you could do it in seconds. And I believe that's using fuel as well. You just press the center button, it'll reset it to normal. So what this does is if you find that you need too much trim one way or another, uh, you can do your center of gravity shift. Um, you can also... Um, run the uh, run the attitude hold in angle attack when you're doing a re-entry which will demonstrate in another video this will actually activate the auto center of gravity shift because you need a set you need an angle of attack that is so high 45 to 50 degrees that um, the air flight control services can't do it alone so you need to shift that center of gravity like crazy back. Um, you need your APU fuel in order to perform the center of gravity shift. So I've just shot it down. Warning, center of gravity shift offline. And you can't shift it because the hydraulic pumps are off. Now, uh, if we happen to or enable the uh, set angle attack uh, autopilot, Hopefully nothing bad will happen here. Using on external cooling offline. Okay, so what just happened? Um, you can see that the APU powered up, and then uh, it's kind of it's kind of hard to tell because it scrolled off screen. But basically, what I did was I activated the um, attitude hold Using autopilot. external O2. Then it, we disabled uh, the external, external cooling, cooling online. Uh, and then the attitude autopilot actually auto started the APU. And that's done, you know, in an emergency during re-entry. So if it needs to start the APU, it will start the APU. There is a way to disable this feature if you like, but I strongly suggest that you don't because it's kind of uh, really important during re-entry to not burn up. On. Okay, so let's just check everything real quick, make sure we're ready to go. We'll close the external Using cooling onboard hatch, O2. and you'll see what's going on. At the very end of the mission, I'm going to demonstrate um, opening the radiator at slow speed. Uh, what we'll do is we'll set the... Uh, we'll set the angle of attack um, for zero. 
and we're going to set the airspeed to... Information. APU fuel 90%. I think 400 is generally what we want at that altitude. Okay. So let's get going. Check my air flight control services real quick. 100 knots. Okay, so let's settle out about 200 meters per second. Uh, we'll be real low for this. Uh, we're now at about 1,500 feet. 500. And once we enter straight and level flight, let's give us just a little bit more gas. Okay, so the APU is active right now. Uh, I'm going to perform a center of gravity shift forward, and you should see the nose drop. There you go. So now we have we would have to use more upward trim in order to uh, compensate for that, and that's done so that you can adjust the angle of the craft with the direction forward. You'll notice if I adjust the center of gravity like crazy forward, now I almost can't maintain upward angle. So we're going to have to center or something bad is going to happen. 300. Okay. Likewise, if I shift the center of gravity aft, now we're Morning. going out of control. Stress. Yep. Be careful about that. So just to note, it can be very dangerous using a uh, center of gravity shift, especially if you go aft. Forward center of gravity shift is somewhat okay, but if you go really aft other than a little bit, um, it will destabilize your craft to the point where you'll spin out and crash. I think that's the cause of one of the Concorde crashes. So take that seriously, aft center of gravity shift. Okay, uh, anything else I want to demonstrate with uh, the center of gravity shift? No, but I did want to check up on the systems here, make the sure that we didn't check. lose anything. All systems green. Okay, so I ended up lucking out there. I did not harm the, the craft in doing that. Um, let's go ahead and turn around now. I've noticed I've also lost a little bit of velocity in that. So we'll just do a quick 70 degree bank to get back to where we were going. Uh, and that's just about everything I wanted to talk about with the center of gravity shift. So the next thing I wanted to do is demonstrate opening the radiator during flight. So you remember I said um, generally uh, 16 kilopascal is your limit. Well, we're at 16 right now. So I'm actually going to have to decelerate just a bit here. And we'll see if we can get to a situation we're holding uh, the radiator open is acceptable. Okay, we're at 13 and a half now. So we should be able to open it. Warning, radiator deployed. Okay, you so are cleared to land. So it wants a little bit more than Warning, that, a little bit radiator less than that, deployed. So I believe it will start giving warning, you warnings radiator deployed. above 13. If I get below 13, I think warning, that's... Radiator deployed. No, it's still going. It's okay. The maximum, warning, as you can see, radiator deployed. down here is 16. As long as I don't exceed 16, we'll be okay. Okay, so, it, so it's 12. 75% uh, is what it's looking for. So we're now under 12 kilopascals dynamic pressure. We actually have the radiator open and we're flying in an atmosphere. Now, this is just enough to maintain cooling as things should turn out. So we're totally fine there.
Okay, and perfect. There's the runway. So let's go ahead and uh, end this thing, shall we? End it nicely, not not the other way. Okay, everyone, that is it. Thank you for joining me. Uh, the next tutorial will be on flight maneuvers. Um, we'll be doing scramjet operations as well as demonstrating several different autopilots. Thank you guys for joining me, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.